Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now I would like to turn the call over to Diane St. Germain. Thank you. Hello. This is Diane St. Germain with the National Cancer Institute. On behalf of the International Society of Quality of Life Research, and the National Cancer Institute, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar series. The series is titled, Best Practices for Integrating Patient Reported Outcomes in Oncology Clinical Trials. The webinar series is comprised of six webinars, each approximately 45 minutes in length. The webinars are designed to be viewed independently to meet the individual learning needs of the participants, or the series can be viewed sequentially in its entirety. Today's webinar is the third in the series and is titled, How to Design a High-Quality Study with Pro Endpoints, presented by Dr. Madeline King, Dr. Michelle Naughton, and Dr. Larry Wenzel. I will now turn it over to Dr. King. Hello, and welcome to this webinar. I'm, we're going to provide you some guidance on how to design a high-quality study with PRO endpoints. My name's Madeline King, and I'm from the University of Sydney, Australia. It's my very great pleasure and privilege to be co-presenting co with Professor Michelle Norton from Wake Forest University, North Carolina, and Professor Larry Wenzel from the University of California, Irvine. Next. Here are the points we will cover in this webinar. I'll start with PRO aims and I'll touch on why it's so important to be clear in specifying and justifying them. I'll then provide some pointers on things to think about when planning your PRO assessments in terms of when, where, how and who to assess. I'll finish by considering the use of auxiliary data, that is additional to PRO data, to supplement missing PRO data. I'll then hand over to Larry Wenzel, who will explain confidentiality issues in PRO data, and she'll present the first of our examples to illustrate how our general points apply to randomized controlled trials. Professor Norton will then present our second example, illustrating how our general points apply to a survivorship cohort study. Next. But before we get started, we wanted to make this general point. The tenets of sound research methodology are universal. They apply to studies with PRO endpoints just as they do to any other type of outcomes. So you shouldn't be surprised by anything that we say in this webinar, and we hope that you'll see how clarity, care, and common sense are all that's required to design a high-quality study with PRO endpoints. Next. The first step in designing the PRO component of your study whether or not your PROs are primary or secondary endpoints, is to clearly specify your PRO aims and the associated hypotheses. This step is absolutely critical. Your PRO hypotheses and aims need to be really clearly defined. It might help you to think about the PICO framework here. Your patient population, your intervention, your comparator or control if it's a randomized setting, and your outcomes. You also need to justify your aims and hypotheses in terms of the clinical relevance, that is, how will they improve the provision of healthcare, and also in terms of importance to patients or survivors, that is, how they will improve the process and or outcomes of care for those patients. And you'll need to make reference to previous literature. What's already known about PROs in this this or similar clinical context, and what's the gap in knowledge that your study will fill? Specific PRO uh, domains of interest also need to be measurable, that is, uh, validated measures of the constructs of interest need to be available. And finally, the PRO assessment methods that you're going to use need to be feasible um, either in the clinic or in the field. Next, having defined and specified your aims and hypotheses, 
you now need to plan your PRO assessment schedule. That is, you've got to select your PRO measures and the time points. Now this will involve thinking about a range of characteristics and constraints of your patient population and clinical context. You need to think about the type of study that's going to be conducted, so considerations for a cohort study will be different for that, from those for a clinical trial, and considerations for a medical intervention will be different from those for a behavioural intervention. These sorts of issues will obviously relate quite directly with your specific aims once you've um, defined those in, in terms of PICO, patients, intervention, comparator and outcomes. You need to think about the nature of the cancer and the treatment or intervention. So for example, the measures and time points for a clinical trial of radiotherapy for prostate cancer will be quite different from those for assessing patients at risk of poor psychosocial outcomes in a survivorship study of ovarian cancer. So thinking about your patient and participant characteristics will help you in deciding which measures and time points. Next. The issue of which PRO measures is a really big one, and indeed there's an entire webinar on this point uh, by Ethan Dash and Bryce Reeve, and we encourage you to listen to that uh, webinar. The remaining points here, who, where and when, and how, are uh, topics that we uh, consider in detail now. Next. Let's think about who first. Now, this basically is your PRO inclusion and exclusion criteria. Ideally, it's best for those involved in the PRO assessments to be just the same subjects as those evaluated for all the study endpoints. This is a practical approach and it's easy to implement. And in terms of the science, it increases your credibility and the interpretability of your results. However, in practice, there may be some limitations. Some folks may have some physical limitations, such as poor uh, vision or an inability to hold a pen or to use a keyboard. Others may have some cognitive problems. Others may have lang a different language or literacy barriers that make self-assessment infeasible. But please try to keep your exclusions down to a min minimum. So for example, the EOTC facet and promise questionnaires are all available in num numerous language translations, and these can be utilized to reduce exclusions due to language. Next. The next thing to think about is where will your PROs be assessed? Now, if you're doing a clinic-based study, then um, the clinic is a very convenient place to assess your PROs because patients are attending for treatment and follow-up. However, when they come to clinic might not be the most informative time. So, for example, if you've got cyclic acute toxic effects like nausea, you might miss them if you assess the PROs just before um, the dose of chemotherapy, which is when the patient comes to clinic. Online PRO assessment is making completion at more informative times much more feasible, and it's also making PRO assessment in non-clinic pace populations, such as survivorship cohorts, more feasible. So that new technology is certainly very promising for giving us more flexibility about where PROs are assessed. Next. You also need to think about how PROs will be assessed, and by this I mean modes of administration. Traditionally, we've had pencil and paper and telephone, uh, commonly called computer-assisted telephone interview or CATI, and increasingly these days we're using electronic self-complete, so touch screens, online, and web-based approaches. I'm going to go through the pros and cons of each of these modes of administration in the next few slides. Next. Let's think about hard copy questionnaires first. The pros of these are that they're very convenient. Patients can complete them while at clinic. Uh, they can have very high completion rates if you have staff at those sites who are handing them out and ensuring that patients give them back. And they have that um, human face-to-face -face contact that uh, really helps with high completion rates. 
And also the, patient, the questionnaire can be completed and collected in one place, which reduces the risk of losing forms. However, on the PROM side, the data entry is by hand, and this is time consuming and prone to human error. If you want to use scanning, then this has setup costs, and it adds work to already full, data manage, uh, full uh, workloads that our data managers and nurses and other CRAs have. Also, when completed at home, returning by post is costly and you have the risk of non-return or loss in the mail. Next, let's think about online questionnaires now. Now, the, the pros of these are that um, links to questionnaires and reminders can be sent by email. Data entry and checking is automated, which reduced costs and it results in a quicker return and efficient data management. And here I'll refer you to a couple of papers, the Green Law and the Fricker papers, which you can um, find and read if you're interested in more details. Also, online questionnaires can optimize the use of skip logic. That's a situation like, if yes to this question, then we want to explore in more detail in the next question. But if no, skip that question. Now, skip logic um, in hard copy questionnaires is very cumbersome, so it's great um, benefit of online and other computer-based questionnaires. Online questionnaires also allow a thing called computer adaptive testing or CAT methods, which you may have heard about uh, and are increasingly being implemented. On the con side, patients can easily ignore email reminders. I'm sure we're all guilty of ignoring some of our emails, right? The cons also are that uh, Online questionnaires require computer literacy and online access, and we can still have technical errors, so when the server is down or there are other connectivity issues. Next, let's think about touchscreens and tablets now. On the pro side, touchscreens in the clinic have proved to be a great success. Numerous studies have shown they're feasible in oncology clinics, and they've been used to great success in screening for discrimination distress in cancer. We see the same benefits here as for online and in-clinic data collection. Indeed, uh, a meta-analysis of 65 studies has shown that uh, paper-completed pencil and paper and computer-based versions have demonstrated equivalence of data of the two modes, which is really great news. And I refer you here to the meta-analysis by Gwalti. On the con side, though, Touch screens and tablets don't eliminate the risk of technical faults, and they do include expenses such as uh, tablets and iPads and software and the additional time that staff need to help patients use these um, data collection methods. Next. The final point now in mode of administration is computer-assisted telephone interview. And uh, these have been used in the past to, ass to assess at times that are not li linked with clinic visits. They can enhance in completion rates, again, because of that human contact element. And importantly, they allow inclusion of respondents who have low literacy with written words or who are not computer literate or who have, have other physical difficulties with self-completion, either via hard copy or computer. They're also good for slightly more complex cognitive tasks, like preference-based measures. Also, data entry can be done at the time of data collection, which makes them very efficient. And they're great if the research has been contracted out to a contract research organization. On the con side, however, they're costly. There's postage for sending out the questionnaires to patients so they have them in front of them during the telephone interview. There's the phone costs and the software and also the additional staff costs. And they're time consuming. There's also some evidence that there's potential bias. And uh, you'll note there that there are three studies uh, which show that there is um, uh, a, a, the tendency for higher scores um, for PROs via telephone administration due to a sort of a social desirability effect. But on the other hand, two studies have shown that telephone uh, PROs are equivalent to self-complete. And again, I've given you the names and uh, years of publication, so you can chase up those papers if you're interested in the details. Next. OK, 
Okay, so that's everything we need to say about PRO administration. Just to review, we've talked about who, and ideally you will include all patients uh, in, the, in your study and minimize exclusions. We've talked about where and how the clinic is a convenient place for research staff, but you also need to think about if it's the most informative time, and home may be a more suitable place, uh, particularly for survivorship studies. We've also talked about how. We've talked about paper-based versus computer-based versus telephone-assisted. We've thought about logistics and costs, set up, uh, data collection, data entry, follow-up and reminder and non-responders, and you need to think about all of these in your own context and in, in the context of uh, the funding that you have and the other resourcing you have. And we've also um, talked about equivalence. And you need to look in the literature to see whether equivalence is proven. And once it is proven, and there is certainly some promising evidence coming out these days, then this is going to open the way for mixed mode designs to enhance participation and response rates for our PROs. Next. Okay, so now we're moving on to the next uh, big uh, topic in this webinar, which is timing of PRO assessments. Now this is absolutely critical. Getting the timing right really matters. The sorts of things you need to think about are, are there acute effects? What are they? And are there late effects? What are they? What are, what are the trajectories over time of acute and late effects? This will help you decide on the timing and frequency of peril assessment, both during the active treatment phase and the survivorship phase, and also how long you want to be following patients up. The final point is acceptable time windows. We also need to think about whether or not to assess patients after they can discontinue therapy, and this is just in the clinical trials context. Next. The first issue in the when question is baseline, and the answer is always. Always have a baseline. The reason is, that there's always a lot of relatively stable between-person variation in PRI measures. That is, it persists over time. So adjusting for baseline is a great way to improve the power of your treatment comparisons. So what is a sensible baseline? Well, you really need to think about what's clinically sensible and what's logistically possible. So for example, if you have a surgical intervention then your baseline really should be pre-surgery. But sometimes that can be a little bit tricky, particularly if the initial surgery is actually part of the diagnostic workup. For studies involving interventions, before the intervention starts is always the best baseline impossible. And if you're running an RCT or a randomized controlled trial, then consider making baseline PRO assessment a criterion for randomization. That's a really great way to get uh, really good compliance rates at baseline. For your survivorship studies, it's a very different sort of situation, and baseline typically is at the recruitment point. Next. Okay, so let's think about when to assess PROs after baseline. Now we need to think about what are the critical time points that need to be assessed to answer your specific research questions and to address your aims. We need to think about both the positive effects of um, your treatment and the adverse effects of the illness and or of the treatment and the time course of these events. When are they likely to occur? Is the effect of the symptom um, constant or intermittent? Is the effect or the symptom related to a specific treatment or to the illness itself? Does the symptom or the effect of treatment get worse, better, or stay the same over time? Next. When I'm consulting with a, a, with, um, a, a researcher or a clinician on designing their studies, I always ask them to think about the trajectories over time and to draw me a little graph. So I'm going, I've given you um, this hypothetical to think about. Here we see a graph with two traces. This is like two different treatment arms in an RCT. And on the vertical axis, we have a toxicity where higher is worse. 
and um, on the horizontal axis we have time going from baseline and then into monthly increments. And you can see that in arm A we have a peak, an early peak in toxicity which then dissipates. In arm B the peak in toxicity is a little later. Now let's just think about those red dotted uh, vert um, vertical lines. Those are at three months, six months and twelve months. These are typical PRO assessment time points. However, in this case, if we assessed at those time points, we would not get the full picture. We would miss the early peak of toxicity arm A, we would miss the late peak of toxicity arm B, and we would really not get an accurate picture of what's going on here. So what I want you to get out of this is that you have to think about when are going to be the highs and the lows and make sure that you assess PROs at those time points. Next. The next thing to think about is how frequently you're going to assess. And this will depend on the PRO. So for example, weekly assessment might be required if you're trying to catch a changing or an unstable symptom. Whereas monthly or even longer assessment periods might be required for more stable PROs. And every six or 12 months might be suitable for survivorship studies. Next. Now let's think about the duration of PRO follow-up. How long should your follow-up continue? If your primary outcome is a survival and you're going out to five years, then it might be tempting to do annual PRO assessments up to five years. However, you've got a problem, which is dropout, and this will be worse with advanced disease. So it's often helpful to think about what your expected attrition rate is going to be given your patient population. And at what point is the PRO data going to be so diminished that the sample is no longer really of interest? A suggestion is to think about expected median survival. And this might provide a good guideline for, the, for ending your planned PRO assessment because at that stage you'll only have, you're likely only to have 50% of the target sample that you started with. Next. Okay, so let's think about a thing called time windows. This is a time period within which the effective interest will be observed and not diluted. You need to think about this and define it in your protocol. Next. In this table, I've just got an example from a palliative radiotherapy trial that I was involved in. And I've used it in this webinar because it's such a nice, clear example of how to define the beginning and end of acceptable time windows. And you'll notice that we start at pre-registration, then we go pre-treatment, during treatment, end of treatment, two weeks after treatment, then six, three months, and six months after treatment. And I won't go into the details, but I'll just notice that the time windows become wider and wider and wider as we move away from treatment because we're moving away from the unstable uh, peaks and troughs and getting out into the stable uh, end of the response trajectories. Next. Okay, so now let's think about event-triggered assessment. Next, this is in relation to episodic PROs. That is, acute events such as pain or post chemo nausea. And that's where you get peaks and troughs. And it might be better to assess these with an event triggered data collection schedule or more intensive diary type assessments. Now, event triggered data collection requires close monitoring and active patient participation to capture the relevant events. Diaries can be useful in these situations. They certainly are responsive to symptoms and side effects, but you can have problems with compliance and missing data are an issue. But there are some promising new developments with electronic diaries and mobile phones that will make these much more feasible. So do keep this in mind if you're dealing with episodic PROs. Next. Survivorship studies are of increasing interest as we get better at treating cancer. 
increasingly cancer is being seen as a chronic disease and there's interest in the experience of patients after they move beyond the active treatment period, which is typically the context for your randomized control trials, and moving out into the survivorship phase. Researchers designing a survivorship study have particular challenges, including when, where, and how to best assess PROs. And they may need to think about much longer time periods. But typically, PROs are assessed at regular intervals, such as every three months after recruitment. But recurrence is a really major event, and you might want to trigger an additional PRO assessment at that time, because PROs are going to be changing then, not only the physical ones of symptoms, but also the psychological impact, the disappointment that cancer has come back. Treatment um, may also be triggered by the recurrence, so then that's going to also affect your PROs. So you might then need to also plan to assess PROs at the end of the treatment to capture the treatment effects. So all of this requires a lot of careful study coordination. Um, when, where, and how are you best going to uh, assess your PROs? Will there be regular clinic assessments, or will you need to uh, figure out how to assess at home? You're going to think about longer time periods. You're going to need to think about, is there going to be a change of care plan? So, for example, uh, this may include moving on to palliative care, which will obviously be a big potential confounder and need to be considered in your analysis plan. And you need to think about reasons for loss to follow up. All of these issues will be illustrated by Professor Norton in example two. Next, just moving back to the RCT context for a moment, because we need to think about what to do with PRO assessments after patients continue, discontinue their therapy. Now, Diane Fairclough in her book uh, emphasizes the need for a clear policy uh, for these kind of patients who can no longer follow the treatment protocol, for example, because toxicity is too great. Off-treatment assessments may be really difficult to obtain because the patients are, may no longer be coming back to clinic or they may have moved on to a different um, place of care. But practical issues really shouldn't determine this decision. You need to think about whether or not these patients need to be followed for scientific robustness. Now one of the issues is that if discontinuation of treatment actually limits future therapy to either more toxic or intensive treatments or to no further treatment due to disease progression, then if you fail to continue PRO assessment, you might, this might lead to selection bias. For example, a treatment arm with a higher rate of dropout may seem to be artificially beneficial. Now, why would that be? Next, because the sicker patients are the ones who are dropping out, right? Okay. Next. Now we should be on the slide that says off therapy rules. I hope we're still uh, all synced together. The off therapy rules approach that Diane Fairclough suggests is a conservative one, which is to continue PRO assessment, because then you'll have the data. Off therapy assessments can always be excluded later, but they cannot be retrieved later. And the reason why she believes in this is because it's in line with intention to treat principles which are adhered to even when a patient withdraws from the, the protocol therapy due to progression or toxicity. Next. Okay, that's it for uh, PRO timing in RCTs. Let's just review what we've considered. Baseline PRO assessment should um, always be done and it should be done pre-randomization and it should be an eligibility criterion for your PRO study. Subsequent PRO time points should be based on treatment cycles, expected toxicities and benefits, for example, in palliative therapies, and the trajectories of the expected um, changes over time, either recovery from toxicities or loss of quality of life due to palliative, oh, sorry, recovery from toxicities or uh, recovery or, um, due to palliative benefit or indeed loss uh, of quality of life once palliative benefit is lost. 
I've, I've um, made a bit of a botch up of that. Um, Diana, are you hearing me? Anyway, the same goes for all arms. So describe uh, your policy for pre-RO assessment after discontinuation after your trial therapy as well. Next. Just to um, review now PRO timing for all study types, remember to match your assessment times to your research questions, your objectives and your hypotheses, and getting the timing right really matters. Consider all the relevant PRO domains, consider the timing and frequency of PRO assessment during your therapy for your acute effects, during follow-up for your late effects, and out into your survivorship time, remembering that recurrence and consequent treatment will also need to be taken into account. The key time points will be the ones that show the uh, important changes on your expected trajectories. And finally, define acceptable time windows for each one of those. Next. The final point that I'd like to make relates to missing data, which are covered in detail in two other of these webinars, uh, and see on the next slide for details of which those are. But the point I'd like to make now is that missing PRO data are inevitable, so you need to plan for them when you're designing your study. To do this, you can plan to, accept to, to collect auxiliary data, that is, additional to non-PRO data that is collected to supplement PRO data. And it's really useful to, to statisticians if it's correlated with the PRO and if it's predictive of missingness. So some common examples in cancer, uh, patient um, performance status, which is rated by a clinician or a nurse. And so you've probably heard of the Karnofsky or the WHO or the ECOG performance status measures. And these um, clearly correlate with physically based PROs. You can also consider having a proxy for the target PRO given by the clinician or a caregiver. The other thing that you can do in planning for missing PRO data is to record the reasons for missing PRO data. The statisticians can use this to assess the missing data mechanisms and the plausibility of their model assumptions. And the reasons and rates can be reported in resultant papers, along with any sensitivity analyses, to aid the interpretation of the PRO results. Next. So here are the details of the other webinars that we recommend you watch uh, to get a, a, a better picture of missing data which are really one of the biggest threats to PRO study quality and interpretability. I, I will now hand over to Professor Wenzel. Next. Thank you, Madeline. Um, I am going to be talking about two subjects, one on confidentiality of PRO data, and second, an example of an ovarian cancer clinical trial. So first on confidentiality, um, given the nature of pro-assessment and the multiple methods in which we can capture these data, as previously reviewed by Professor King, it's important to address levels of confidentiality which may or may not be available within these data sources. So I would ask you to imagine, for example, utilizing a measure to screen for emotional distress within a busy oncology outpatient clinic. If the patient scores at or above a particular threshold, this would trigger a follow-up conversation during this clinic visit between a member of the treatment team with the patient. This is enhancing good clinical practice and clinical care and something most people would appreciate. However, if these data are also part of a clinical trial or a survivorship study, has the patient been made aware of or consented to use of the PRO scores for clinical care? And does the patient know that in addition to trial data, this may be included as part of the medical record? It has been customary for patients to be informed that their data are confidential and will not be shared with others outside of the trial team or treatment team and will be securely stored. However, when you're looking at additional considerations for use of pros, you would also need to have additional conversations and assurances that may be necessary, such as the example just shared. Next. So the level of data protection may indeed depend on the mode of administration. So 
So again, it's important to ask who has access to the information, how are the data stored, how are they transferred, and how secure is this method? So for example, our paper pencil pros in the clinic, is it de-identified and should it be? Who has access? And how often do these data change hands? From the patient to a clerk to a nurse to a doctor to data entry, um, others? And could these forms be lost? Um, so that is one concern related to confidentiality with paper pencil pros. With computer-assisted interviews, there may be greater protection, particularly if it's entered directly during the interview. And then finally, your computer-based self-entry might allow the greatest level of protection of data. Next. And again, the level of data may depend on the mode and who has access to confidentiality. So a couple scenarios in which confidentiality um, may be of concern, although rare, may be a situation in which the patient does not want family members, for example, to see their responses to probes. Um, this may occur if they don't want someone to know their actual level of pain or actual level of despair. So how these data are protected is important as they're being collected. Similarly, if a proxy is actually um, providing information on behalf of the patient, is this truly confidential? And similarly, is there a risk of misinterpretation of these data uh, due to uh, proxy level um, provision of response? So to summarize the confidentiality discussion, consider within clinical trials and survivorship studies that we tell the patient that their information and responses to questions is confidential but that level of confidentiality can be challenged or maximized depending on the mode of data capture and the measures taken to secure and store the data during collection, and then also the importance of considering data transfer and analyses. Next. Now moving on to a different topic is our example of a phase three randomized control trial. I'm not go now going to describe how use of pros have influenced development of a phase three randomized trial in the setting of advanced ovarian cancer. And this is a study conducted by the Gynecologic Oncology Group. Next. So with this disease, intravenous chemotherapy has been the standard or traditional treatment for first-line advanced ovarian cancer. However, the use of intraperitoneal or IP therapy in which a port is placed into the abdomen has conferred a survival benefit compared to IV-only treatment in some trials. Thus, these are two very different modes of treatment delivery, making the question of quality of life difference very germane in this study. So in this study, we've compared pros on quality of life, neurotoxicity, fatigue, and nausea and vomiting in order to determine if one or both of our chemotherapy IP regimens improve progression-free survival compared to IV therapy. Next. So our rationale for pros inclusion um, was really constructed on a, a prior study in which we demonstrated that IP treatment provided the longest median survival for this uh, ovarian cancer patient population, however, with significantly worse quality of life during the active treatment period and worse neurotoxicity developing during active treatment and also one year post-treatment. Next. So we asked then, what would the survival benefit of IP um, uh, advantage would be if we were able to reduce toxicity and some of the logistic issues concerned with its use? So in fact, the survival benefit of IP would have made this approach standard of care, except that it was too toxic and there were concerns of logistic issues. So subsequently, the treatment was modified and we justified um, the modifications to assess benefits and untoward effects of both therapies. And we did this in part through retaining many of our um, quality of life measures. And for this, we used the FACT measurement tools. We also added fatigue um, because we recognized that this was a particular uh, problem for this population. Next. So the null hypothesis was that the mean scores at the specified time points would be independent of the randomized treatment. And then our question 
we, or we would hypothesize perhaps that the pros are significantly different between treatment arms during active treatment with IP arms having poorer quality of life during active treatment but without significant difference subsequently. However, the in informed important clinical question is, since the treatment arms were modified in this trial to be less toxic, perhaps PFS and OS, their overall survival, remain superior in the IP arm, but the pros are no longer significantly different. So what we're examining is how the treatment alterations in this trial uh, reduce the IP versus IV differences on the pros and whether or not these differences persist over time. Next. So in order to examine both uh, differences associated with acute treatment as well as uh, longer treatment, um, long-term differences, we wanted to capture assessments that were between regimen during active treatment, persistent long-term differences, and potential emerging late effects. And so you could see the timing of these assessments. To we'll answer questions related to both active treatment and persistent differences, we obtained assessments at five specific time points. It's important to note the later time points also allowed us to capture any benefits associated with maintenance therapy. As Dr. King has mentioned, our interpretation of results is only as good as the data we've captured. You'll see that with this population, valid and comprehensive data is relatively easy to obtain at baseline, but unfortunately decreases over time. This population rarely misses answers, so missed items are very few. But missing data means missing the entire assessment, often because the patient is too sick or she's been taken off study. And indeed, institutions often make the mistake that off study means they no longer collect pro data. This is an institutional error since these data are still needed and still analyzed. So we need to continue to work with sites to capture assessments in a timely and valid manner. Next. So we don't have results of that trial. Results will be available in December of 2014, but I wanted to share with you this last slide, um, which is an example of an evidence base for symptoms or domains important in ovarian cancer clinical trials. So since it helps to inform measurement selection per domain of interest in ovarian cancer, what you'll see is that certain symptoms or domains may be particularly important for this population and for your consideration as you construct a trial. So these include, for example, aspects of disease-related symptoms such as abdominal discomfort, difficulty breathing, fatigue, and pain, as well as a primary treatment side effect for this population is unfortunately uh, neuropathy or development of neurotoxicity. So I refer you to the 2014 JNCI issue which provides a comprehensive discussion of evidence bases for quality of life and pro assessments across many disease sites. So it is now Professor Naughton who will speak about a survivorship cohort study. Thank you, Dr. Wenzel. Since much of our focus so far in this webinar has focused on clinical trials, we believed it important to also provide an example using a non-clinical trial design. So our second um, example is a survivorship cohort study. The particular aims of this study um, that was examining menstrual cycle maintenance and quality of life after breast cancer treatment was to look at chemotherapy-related amenorrhea and menstrual cycling of women diagnosed with invasive breast cancer between the ages of 18 and 45 years of age. So these are quite young women, and many of you may be familiar with breast cancer. The majority, we have many studies on breast cancer, but the majority are on those who are above the age of 50 and particularly above the age of 60 years of age and uh, treatment-related amenorrhea, infertility uh, are major issues um, for these young women. And our second aim was to track the health-related quality of life of these women over time, looking at long-term physical and psychological symptoms and following them at least through from baseline through five years. 
Now, the next series of slides are, are going to outline protocol, treatment considerations, and participant characteristics that are relevant to the design of this particular trial. So the protocol considerations were we recruited 836 patients. They were recruited at seven clinical sites across the U.S. Um, within eight months of their diagnosis. The majority of the women were diagnosed around eight months from the time of being diagnosed and the time in enrolling to the study. So we didn't get them prior to treatment, which is one difference if you were looking at a treatment um, trial. We wanted to see how they were faring if they were in the midst of chemo um, and in other types of treatments um, moving forward. All of the baseline forms were completed in the clinic, and participants did them on pen and paper forms. And then actually the staff who were participating with us mailed the forms to the centralized coordinating center. All patients were followed up by mail at six-month intervals, so they did not come back to the clinic for any of these types of assessments. And it freed us up in some some, to some extent in terms of we did not have to worry about coinciding with particular treatment or particular side effects. We wanted to look at their long-term symptoms and quality of life. So the questionnaires were mailed from the coordinating center um, to the participants and then they completed them and mailed them back to the coordinating center. And in terms of treatment or intervention considerations, this was an observational study, so we didn't have to make allowances or design um, measures that were trying to look at treatment effects or an intervention type of an effect. We did, though, need to think about such things as what, what were the characteristics of this population, what is the survival like, and how might they change as they move from active um, adjuvant therapy moving on. And the five-year survival was projected to be about 85%. And the reason that that is important is that it gives you an idea of kind of what your losses might be in terms of loss to follow-up, and also how well or how ill this patient population might be. So we also, though, there are some um, participants and patients who didn't always um, go off of um, treatment or, or they had maybe chemotherapy but they didn't have radiation therapy, but we tracked all of the, the following chemotherapy if they had it, radiotherapy, hormonal therapy, and any surgeries as well as recurrences. In terms of the participant characteristics, a, a key for this study is these are young women. They were all English speakers for the most part. We did enroll some Spanish speakers, but most of them were able to complete the forms in English. Um, we did exclude patients who had any major uh, mental or cognitive impairments at baseline, but we did not for people who might have had developed cognitive um, difficulties throughout the course of the follow-up period or any depressive symptoms. They were not excluded um, later on. The key for us, and that actually was an advantage to the particular method that we used, is that these women were young enough and capable enough of completing the forms independently and then also returning the forms in the mail of that. And a key point is also that the majority of participants within about a year post-diagnosis or within about 18 months, a year post-treatment chemotherapy, if they received it, were feeling fairly well and were moving back into, into their um, lives or with work or with family. So when we approached the task of selecting um, patient reported outcome measures, we wanted to look for validated measures that had been used with breast cancer patients. And the, the point of that was is we wanted to be able to compare to other cancer studies over time or also to compare a younger cohort with um, perhaps an older um, cohort of women. Um, we also needed to make sure that the directions and the form layout was easy to follow because we would not have staff people there um, when they were doing the follow-up forms um, at home. 
we also knew that we were going to be doing repeated measures. And a key was is that we had to have some balance of measures that would apply equally well to those who were undergoing active cancer therapy as well as um, following them through five years or more. And some of these women are now 12 years out. Um, and then also the very important balance of if you want to gather the information that you believe is necessary or essential, but you need to keep your participant burden to a minimum. So this is just an example of, of the quality of life measures that were selected. Um, we also looked at the um, FACT B, the Functional Assessment of Cancer Therapy. Um, but because after a period of time, these women were going to be more and more removed from active therapy, we also wanted to put some type of a generic quality of life measure there as well. Um, and we also, that also enabled us to do several different analyses looking at a cancer-specific measure, which is the fact B, with also more of a generic um, physical and mental health status measure. Um, other kind of symptom and lifestyle measures that we included is that we, we did menstrual bleeding calendars because that was a major focus of this particular uh, study, is that we actually, these women were, were very faithful and that they filled out monthly bleeding calendars for us up through about five to six years um, post-diagnosis. And we did basically wanted to see how their uh, menstrual bleeding um, co-varied with different types of symptoms, such as hot flushes, vasomotor symptoms, and so on, so that we were looking at um, kind of a proxy of a um, physical measure um, and then how the, the symptoms that they might have might co-vary with the menstrual bleeding calendars. Um, we also tracked um, if they had any additional cancer treatment during follow-up. Um, we looked at their reproductive history, if they became pregnant, if they wanted to become pregnant, um, and what the outcomes were. Um, but then we also looked at several other things, such as depressive symptoms, sexual functioning, sleep disturbance, which are um, fairly common uh, related things for people who might be amenorrheic and then going through menopause. Um, there and we also looked at so social support and lifestyle risk factors such as smoking, alcohol, physical activity, and so on. Also, just as a side note, that not all of the um, PRL measures might be, you know, related to symptom or quality of life assessment. Um, you might also be testing an intervention at some point, which was not the focus of this particular study. Um, but you need to pay attention to kind of retention activities and who might drop out differentially during the course of a trial. And we were very um, conscious of trying to build in incentives or retention um, for this particular cohort, and we did some things as we had incentives for quarterly drawings, um, for gift certificates um, to different things. All of the participants um, got an annual gift. We tried to make things as simple as we could. Um, the participants could do the questionnaires over the phone if they didn't want to hassle with sending them back and forth. And also, if it meant keeping participants in follow-up, we eliminated some study forms um, over time. And the study team actually identified up front what were the pertinent or the essential forms that we like to have the staff, the participants complete. Um, but it's very important when you're doing a long-term study is that, that you have some flexibility and some thought given a priority to what are the essential components that you would like to have these participants complete. But the main goal is to keep them involved and engaged in the, the study. So just to recap the major points is you need to make sure that you specify all your PRO aims up front and justify them with reference to the literature and past work in the area. You need to specify the details of the PRO assessments. Um, when they would occur, where, how, and who will be completing the assessments. You might also consider uh, collecting auxiliary forms. And, and as uh, Dr. King had mentioned,
intervention, this might help further validate um, some of the PR instruments or, or also importantly, maybe assist in explaining some of your study findings um, that you might have. Also need to always consider confidentiality issues and protecting and safeguarding the rights of the um, participants as research subjects. But all of these apply, uh, points apply equally well to all study designs. Um, but it's, it's more how you apply these types of principles that will differ across studies and also by the patient population and the clinical context of your, your study. There are many um, uh, things, and there's a fair amount of literature now on PRO assessment. Um, but one reference that we did want to provide you, which is excellent, um, is one by Dennis Faircla looking at the design and analysis of quality of life studies in clinical trials. This is, is an excellent reference um, that you can use um, to guide and, and also to supplement some of the material um, from this particular webinar. This ends our webinar, and we hope that the information and guidelines we presented will assist you in designing high-quality clinical trials with PRO endpoints. These slides, in conjunction with the other ISOQUAL presentations in this best practices series, provide you with solid research fundamentals in integrating PROs into oncology trials. We wish you very happy and productive research endeavors. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. Diane, Larry, Michelle, anyone?